I remember when uh, <clears throat> my, car, my, my mom was in a car accident when she was 55 years of age. And she was left paralyzed. Um, Bev and I had recently become engaged to be married at the end of that year. We prayed for my mom, no change. I prayed for a miracle, no change. And after three years, she gave up fighting and died. Did God hear my prayers? Have you heard people say, where was God when I needed him? Have you ever said that phrase? Meaning, God did not give me what I wanted. Where was God? I've heard people say to me, where was God when, as a little girl, I was abused? Where was God when I had cancer? Where was God when I was hurting? And it's like, the implication is God wasn't there, isn't there. Dan, I'm so glad to see you here in church today. You had a horrific experience with your foot and, and, and try to fight with a lawnmower, but I'm glad you're here. And I hear healing is happening, and I hear God is good, right? He's there, he's with you, he's guiding you. We all have accidents or we have illness or worse still cancer we are human beings. And in our humanity, we do stuff that hurts. And we ask the question, how does healing happen? How does healing happen? How did Jesus heal? Let's have a look at that. Healing, I find in Scripture, Jesus healed. Did the disciples heal? Yes, I find that they also were used as instruments of healing. And the question then is, what about us today? Does God use us as well as instruments of healing? And how does this work? Jesus healed, Matthew 4, verse 23. What, is G what does it say? What does Scripture say? Matthew 4, and there verse 23 and 24. It says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom. So Jesus was a preacher, and it says, and he healed every kind of disease and illness, every kind. So there wasn't, you know, a case of, uh, you know, doctors today say, never heard of that tropical disease, you better go to a tropical specialist, I, I, I can't heal that, I don't, I don't have answers for that type of disease. Um, news about him spread as far as Syria, the people soon began bringing to him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease. Jesus didn't care about what kind it was, did he? Sickness just seemed to have a problem in his presence. Whenever their, uh, their sickness, uh, whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all, says my Bible. Every single one. He didn't say, okay, you we can heal, you not, no, you too bad a sinner, we're not going to heal you. Uh, no, we're going to heal you, no, we're not going to heal you. It's like scripture says he healed them all. Everyone who sought him out, who came to him for healing, it was like they were all healed. No, that's one example. What about the disciples' healing? Let's have a look at Mark chapter 6 and Acts 5. Mark chapter 6 and there verse 12. Says, so the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. Notice Jesus did the same. He preached the gospel and healed. The disciples preached the gospel and what, it's, what does it say in verse 13? And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with oil, olive oil. I sometimes hear of preachers, circuit preachers or TV preachers or whatever, and their main purpose is to go around healing, and they have healing services, healing, healing, healing. That's their target, that's their goal. I don't see this here, do you? I see this as the target is to preach the gospel, and then healing takes place, those who needed it. I find that Jesus is saying to his disciples, go out, tell everyone to repent of their sins, turn to God, and then... It says, they cast out demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Anointing them with olive oil. They were in Mark chapter 6, verse 13. 
Now we go to Acts 5. What, is, what happened there? As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought into the streets on beds and mats. As a result of their work, what did they do? What did Peter do on Pentecost? He preached, right? He preached. As a result of his preaching, people came and they brought their sick and their ill because they believed in the power of God. And it says, um, sick people were brought out in, into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Verse 16, crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits and they were some healed, all healed. Everyone was healed, and they were all healed. God did amazing things through Jesus, his, his son, through the disciples, through his followers. They, too, were blessed with the power of healing. Hmm. That is very, very, very challenging. And the question comes to mind, right, in your mind, as in mine, why is that not so powerful today? Why is that not happening in the same way today? Now, um, let's have a look at James and their 5 verse 14. Is there something about us healing today? James 5 14 says, Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Is that something that God puts out there and says, you, you, and you can do? Yeah, absolutely. He says, you and I can do this, should do this. This is something God challenges us to do, to be instruments in his hands. If uh, you pray for somebody and they get healed, uh, what does that do for you? Do you feel, well, I'm now this special person, you know, I become this prophet or prophetess, and I'm the, this holy person, and, you know, it gets to my head, or whatever it may be, because God used me as an instrument? When you're working out there in your uh, shed, uh, in your workshop, or whatever it may be, Steve, when you're busy working out there, and you're using that screwdriver, and the screwdriver works and gets the screw out. And maybe it's one of your machine power tools that does that. Does that machine power tool all of a sudden start talking back at you and saying, I'm better than you, I can do this, I'm great, and it starts getting puffed up with pride? Obviously not. Stupid thing is a inanimate, it's there. It, it's a tool for you to use. When I'm a tool in God's hands, can I have the same attitude as that screwdriver or that pair of pliers? And simply say, Lord, I am your instrument. It's not for me to get puffed up. It's not for me to get prideful. God simply wants to use us all in the church of God to, as a unity to support each other and to be there for each other. Sometimes God needs to speak through somebody to me. Sometimes I need someone to vicariously pray and intercede for me in prayer when I find it hard to do, right? And you've done that. You've stood next to a hospital bed where the person themselves are comatose. And you pray for them. You are interceding for them. And God answers prayer in his way. One of the hard lessons that I've learned in life as I've been working with people and counseling with people is the following. Um, I, I wrote it down as um, Jerry's Law, and I don't want to be egotistical is just Jerry's learning experience. That's all it is. And some of you have learned the same type of thing. But um, this is what I learned. I learned that effectual change of what you cannot accept always is preceded by acceptance. Have you noticed that? When I don't like something, change doesn't happen until an attitude or a spirit of acceptance happens. And then God steps in. When I'm kicking against the pricks, when I'm fighting, I need to come to the point where I relax, I let go and let God. And that's what I mean by acceptance. 
It doesn't mean that I condone if it's sinful or bad. That's not what I'm saying. Acceptance is more than condoning. Acceptance is an attitude of accepting God's power to happen. In other words, it simply means thy will be done. That's basically what it means. So, what is the prayer of relinquishment? I've shared this with some of you, and I, we've talked about it a little bit. Catherine Marshall wrote an article in Guidepost many, many years, 1960 to be exact. And she wrote an article called The Prayer of Rel Relinquishment, which was republished a while ago, and I read this and I just said, wow, that's exactly what Jerry's Law is referring to. Effectual change of that which I cannot accept is always preceded by acceptance. What does she say? Listen to, uh, to this. She says, like most people, when I first became active in experimentation with prayer, I was full of questions, such as, why are, so, are some agonizingly sincere prayers granted while others are not? Have you asked that question? Do you have an answer for it? These are tough questions. Why do pastors get challenged with stuff? I wish it was always easy, Romney. <laughs> These are tough stuff. But you know, I enjoy being challenged by tough stuff. That's probably why I like being a pastor. Okay. Why are some agonizingly sincere prayers granted while others are not? She says, I still have questions. Mysteries about prayer always ahead of present knowledge, luring, beckoning on to further experimentation on my walk with God. But one thing I do know, she says, I learned it through hard experience. It's a way of prayer that has resulted consistently in a glorious answer. Glorious because each time power beyond human reckoning has been released. And this I call the prayer of relinquishment. Or as I call it, the prayer of thy will be done. I got the first glimpse, she says, of it in the fall of 1943. I've been ill for six months with a lung infection, and a bevy of specialists seemed unable to help. Persistent prayer, using all the faith I could muster, had resulted in nothing. I was still in bed full time. One afternoon, I read the story of a missionary who had been an invalid for eight years. Constantly, she had prayed that God would make her well so that she might do his work. Finally, worn out with futile petition. Have you been at that place? Ready to give up? Just wanting to give up? She prayed, all right, God, I give up. I give up. If you want me to be an invalid, then that's your business. Have you prayed that prayer? Anyway, I want you even more than I want health. You decide, Lord. What a prayer. Kind of angry. Emotion right there. In two weeks, the woman was out of bed completely well. The prayer of relinquishment. Now, this made no sense, writes Catherine, yet the story would not leave me. On the morning of September 14, how can I ever forget that date? I came to the po same point of abject acceptance. I'm tired of asking was the burden of my prayer. I'm beaten, God. You decide what you want for me. Tears flowed. I had no faith as I understood faith, accepted nothing. The gift of my sickness, my sick self, was made with no trace of graciousness on my part. And the result? It was as if I had touched a button that opened the windows of heaven. As if some dynamo of heavenly power began flowing, within a few hours I had experienced the presence of the living Christ in a way that wiped away doubt and revolutionized my life. From that moment, my recovery began. It's, it's like I'm, I'm holding on. Lord, you can't do this. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. And he's waiting for me. You know, my hand is like this. It's clenched. No, you can't. Lord, I'm holding on. No, you can't. And the moment I accept 
by opening my hand and letting go of that which I am clinging to, whether it be my child or my wife or my husband or my mother or my father. Lord, you cannot make her die. You remember Hezekiah asking for another 15 years? And God graciously gave it to him. And during that time, his son Manasseh was born, a wicked king. Wow. In the, through this incident, God was trying to teach me something important about prayer, she writes. Gradually, I saw that a demanding spirit with self-will as its rudder blocks prayer. I understood that the reason for this was that God absolutely refuses to violate our free will. That therefore, unless self-will is voluntarily given up, even God cannot move to answer prayer. He says, in time I gained more understanding about the prayer of relinquishment through the experiences of others in contemporary life and in a reading. Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is a pattern for us, I learned. Christ could have avoided the cross. He did not have to go to Jerusalem that last time. Did you know that? He didn't have to. He could have compromised with a priest. He could have bargained with Caiaphas. He could have capitalized on his following and appeased Judas by setting up the beginning of an uh, earthly kingdom. Pilate hmm, wanted to release him, all but begged him to say the right words so that he might. Remember that? In the garden, Christ had plenty of time to flee, but he used his free will to leave the decision up to his father. J.B. Phillips translates that verse in the Gospels. Dear Father, all things are possible to you. Please let me have, not have to drink this cup. Yet it is not what I want, but what you want. What did he, what did he want? He wanted that cup to pass him by. He clearly said that. And we can say, Lord, I want my child to live. But... I'm opening my hand and letting it go. Your will be done. Do you sometimes have prayers that uh, aren't answered? Was Jesus' prayer answered? When he said, I want this cup to pass me by, was that prayer answered? No. Did God say yes? No. It was answered in a different way, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't given to him. It was, he, he, I want this cup to pass. Was that given to him? No. He died. Sometimes my child dies. Jesus died. His prayer was not answered. And if his prayer was not answered, sometimes our prayers are not answered. But the bottom line is, thy will be done. Okay? Thy will be done. Wow. So, even when Jesus was bowing to the possibility of death by crucifixion, he never forgot either the presence or the power of God. The prayer of rel relinquishment must not be interpreted negatively. It does not let us lie down and in the dust of a godless universe, steal ourselves just for the worst. It's not a case of, oh, I'm just capitulating, now I'm going to grovel in the, in, in the dirt. That's not what this is saying. Rather, it is, this is my situation at the moment. I'll face the reality of it. And I'll also accept willingly whatever a loving father sends me. Acceptance, therefore, never slams the door on hope. Did you get that? Acceptance never slams the door on hope. It simply puts it in the hands of God. Yet even with hope, our relinquishment must be the real thing because this giving up of self-will is the hardest thing we human beings are ever called on to do. I remember the agony of Sarah, an attractive young girl who shared with me her doubts about her engagement. I love Jeb, she said, 
but he drinks. Not that he's an alcoholic, yet the drinking is a sort of a symbol of a lot of ideas he has. This has bothered me so much that I wonder if God is trying to tell me to give him up. As we talked, Sarah came to the conclusion that she would lose something precious if she didn't follow the highest and the best thing she knew. Tears glistened in her eyes as she said, I'm going to break the engagement. If God wants me to marry Jeb, he will see that things change about the drinking and all. Right then, simply and poignantly, she told God of her decision. She was putting her broken dreams and her future into his hands. Jeb's ideas and drinking did not change, so she did not marry him. But a year later, she wrote me an ecstatic letter. It nearly killed me to give Jeb up. Yet God knew that he wasn't the one for me. Now I've met the man and we're to be married. Now I really have something to say about trusting God. It's good to remember that not even the master shepherd can lead if the sheep have not this trust in him. In other words, we bind the hands of God. That's the way or the why of Christ's insistence on practical obedience. And why call he me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, verse 46. When we come right down to it, how can we make obedience real? Except as we give over our self-will in reference to each of life's episodes as they unfold in our life. That's why it shouldn't surprise us that the heart of the secret of answered prayer lies in this law of relinquishment, thy will be done. So, Mrs. Nathaniel Hawthorne, wife of the famous American author, found, as she wrestled in prayer in the city of Rome one day in 1860, Una, the Hawthorne's eldest daughter, had a virulent form of malaria. The attending physician had that afternoon warned that unless the young girl's fever abated before morning, she would die. As Mrs. Hawthorne sat by Una's bed, her thoughts went to what her husband had said earlier that day. I cannot endure the alternations of hope and fear. Therefore, I have settled with myself not to hope at all. But the mother could not share Nathaniel's hopelessness. Una could not, must not die. This daughter had the finest mind, the most complex character of all their children. Why should some capricious providence demand that they give her up? As the night deepened, the girl lay so still that she seemed to be in the anteroom of death. The mother looked out the winter window onto the Piziaza. A dark and silent sky was heavy with clouds. I cannot bear this loss. Cannot, cannot. Then suddenly, unaccountably, another thought took over. Why should I doubt the goodness of God? Let him take Una, if he sees best. I can give her to him. No, I won't fight against him anymore. Having made that great sacrifice, Mrs. Hawthorne expected to feel sadder. Instead, she felt lighter, happier than at any time since her daughter's long illness had begun. Some minutes later, she walked back to the girl's bedside, felt her daughter's forehead. It was moist and cool. 
Una was sleeping naturally, and the mother rushed into the next room to tell her husband that a miracle had just taken place. Now the intriguing question about this is that uh, what is the spiritual law that's implicit in this law or prayer of relinquishment? Fear is so part of our humanity, isn't it? And fear is like a screen erected between us and God. It cuts us off from God's miracles so that his power cannot go through us, cannot reach us. So how does one get rid of fear? This is not easy when we, <laughs> we, want, it, um, when we want something that we really want. At times, every emotion, every passion is tied up in the dread that what we fear is about to come upon us. Obviously, only drastic measures can deal with such a gigantic fear and the demeaning spirit that usually goes along with it. Trying to deal with it by repeating faith affirmations is not drastic enough. You know, sometimes we just say, oh, I'll trust, I'll trust, I'll trust, I'll trust, and it still doesn't work. It still doesn't work. So, then we are squarely up against this, this, this challenge to relinquish, to let go. Was Jesus showing us how to do this when he said, resist not evil? In God's eyes, fear is evil because it is an acting out of a lack of trust in him. It grips us. It paralyzes us. Jesus is saying, admit the possibility of what you fear most. My child will die. I will die. Force yourself to walk up to that fear. Look at it in the, in the face, never forgetting that God and his power is still the supreme reality of that moment. And the fear will evaporate. Drastic? Well, yes, it's, a, it's, it's not easy to do that. But it is one sure way of releasing prayer power into human affairs is not running away from my fear, but actually facing it and just looking it in the face until that fearful, frightening power dissipates because God has given me that power. He becomes in charge of my life and takes my fear away. So what about when Jesus pray, prayed in, in suffering for himself? I mean, uh, we've already discovered that uh, he did not necessarily get what he prayed for, right? Matthew 26, verse 39, he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. His own disciples aren't there with him. He's battling on his own. He went a little further, bowed to, with his face on the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. And then this yet changes everything when he says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And at that moment, there's a release. There's a handing over. There's a giving into the hands of him who is more powerful. People often say, well, if God is so powerful, why can't he heal all the brokenness in the society? Why can't he heal all the little children that are crying and hurting in pain? Our hospitals are full of little children, innocent people that are hurting. If God is powerful, why can't he do that? Hmm. This is his power. This is his power. When I ask what was the outcome, what I hoped for, was his suffering taken away from him there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, obviously not. Instead, God gave him power to bear it. And he sends whom? A powerful angel to come to his side and to encourage him and bear him up when he's at his point of death. God doesn't always answer our prayer. His will is not always that my sickness dissipates and disappears. But he promises what? He promises power. He promises his presence. And you know what? If you ever uh, or have never experienced that, practicing the presence of God, like that little book of Brother Lawrence says, is a powerful tool. I want to challenge you to practice. Start that today if you haven't done that. Practice the presence of God every minute, moment of your day. 
practice that presence of God, especially when things don't work out, especially when you don't get when you want, what you want, especially when you're sick, especially when you're lying there and life seems to ebb away at the end. And one of the, lastly, one of the finest uh, scriptures that I can find in the Bible on a perspective, a healthy perspective towards health, I find in Romans 8, verse 17 to 37. I want us in closing to have a quick look at that before we close. Verse 17 there says, Since we are his children, we are his heirs, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs in, uh, of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Principle number one. Christ suffered, I too will suffer. I can't say, well, uh, God protects, will protect me. He promises that nothing bad is going to ever happen to me. He suffered. We're in a veil of suffering. In my humanness, I too will suffer can, and can expect it. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to what he will reveal to us later, it says. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Now, I, I, I'm waiting for that day, are you? He, sa he says that clearly. Isn't this what we believe? We believe that there is suffering now. We, do we also believe that there's going to be a second coming and an end of this age? Yes, we do. For all creation is moaning, waiting eagerly. Verse 20, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Notice those three little words in my Bible. It says, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. God's curse. Um, God doesn't will suffering, does he? He doesn't want it to happen. He didn't plan it. Sin is behind it. Satan is behind it. All creation was subjected to God's curse. With, but with eager hope, he says, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. There will be a day of freedom from death and decay, and that day is not yet. Verse 22, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right to the present time. How many of us haven't groaned? And nature groans. We see little animals hurt, killed, maimed, uh, pets. People don't treat them right. Things happen that are dastardly, terrible, bad in this world of ours. This is where we're at at this time. And we all long as it says there in verse 23, for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day that God will give us full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised. Do you notice there it says that there's going to be a time when we will get new bodies? So why would, why would I want that day to come if I had a new body now? This body is subject to death and sin and illness. It's not a new body. And through the sinful state I'm in, I long to have a new body. Jesus doesn't promise me a new body right now. He promises me a new body when he comes, when he sends his son. Verse 24, we have given this hope, are given this hope when we were saved. Uh, verse 25, but if we look forward to something we don't or, uh, yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Verse 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Sometimes we mumble in our prayers for someone who is sick. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The best I can say is, thy will be done. I can't tell God what to do. I have no insight, foresight. I don't know the future. Verse 27. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Do you see that? Oh, Holy Spirit, when I'm sick, you pray for me. You pray through my lips. You pray for me. You pray because you know. I don't know. You can pray in harmony with God's will. I'm sometimes just very much against God's will. Verse 28, and we know that God causes everything 
to work to the, uh, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God has a way of making things work out for his overall good, for my overall good. And how does he do that? I don't have the faintest idea because I'm limited. But he knows and I can rest in his amazing knowledge. Verse 29, for, people, for God knew his people in, the, in advance. He chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. Having called them, he gave them the right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. You and I have the promise in God that we are God's children. And if we are God's children, you know what? I'm just going to put it in a colloquial way. I don't care what happens to me because he cares do you understand what I'm saying because he cares I can relinquish this to, into his hands I can say Lord you, you just deal with this body and this mind you know you, you just sometimes my mind doesn't work that well anymore sometimes my body doesn't work that well anymore God please take over verse 35 can anything ever separate us from God's love can you put sickness in there too? Can sickness separate you from God's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? I love the way this Bible puts it. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we are sick? So I'm sick. Does that mean God has left me now? I'm not hearing that he's answering my prayer, so he must have left me. This is saying when we have calamity, does that mean that he no longer loves us? He's gone on a journey. Or are perse when we are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death, as the scripture says, for his sake we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. Knowing despite of all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing, do you hear that word? Nothing. That would include sickness, right? Can ever separate us from God's love. Does sickness... Is sickness devastating? Yes. Does it demoralize? Does it make me feel like yuck? Does it make me feel like I just want to die? Yes. But does it ever get me to the point where I say, well, I feel so bad God must not like me anymore? No. God's love is still there. And he has his plan that he's working out. If I'm holding on to something, I want to relinquish that and say, Lord, I just want to accept your good will for me right now, whatever that is. Put this in your hands. That doesn't mean that I don't fight or give up hope. See, the moment a person gives up hope, he dies. Right? You've seen that happen to people. Hope is not holding on to. Hope is hoping in God, trusting in God. That is releasing into his hands. And then I work according to God's will, and I will to get better. Yes, I need to will to get better, as he allows that to happen. Hope never dies. Neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears nor to, uh, for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God for that. I know some of you are sitting here and praising God because your cancer is in remission. Because God has brought you through the bronchitis or whatever tr troubles you had in the last couple of months. Some of you are going to be sick this year, sometime. In a month, two months, six months, nine months time, you probably will be sick again. How are you going to deal with sickness? How do we cope with sickness? Lord... Give me that amazing courage to accept that which I cannot accept by opening my hand and saying, your will be done. Not my will be done, Lord, but your good will in my life. You think of Tori at, uh, in hospital. We think of others that are 
hurting. We think of Dolores recuperating. And we just lift them all up before you, Lord, and we just long for your powerful presence to be with them. Grant to them your good will. Touch their lives in your way, Lord. And may your name be praised through our illness and our suffering. And may we see suffering as a privilege and not as a curse because we know whom we believe. We know what our end destination is and we look forward to receiving those brand new bodies in the resurrection or at your second coming when you change us in the twinkling of an eye. Hasten that beautiful day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.